Greg Hunt is here from all the way from Purdue. That's like in West Lafayette kind of a thing. He drove all the way down through here through snow this deep and yeah, no, uphill I mean, both ways. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I am just tickled plumb to death to have this man here. Um, this is our go-to guy for go-to guys. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I don't even know why you came to see us, but I am so pleased that you have. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having and, me. Uh, warm up here. I'm going to talk about two things, I guess. The pesticide issues and varroa mites. Because most of my research is on honeybee health issues and bee genetics. But first let's talk about the pesticides. In 2010, we started to see bee kills in front of our hives. And our neighbors were planting corn. And it was, it was unusually warm and dry and windy. It was like April 22nd and 85 degrees or 80 degrees. And we got bee kills, uh, except for our apiary that wasn't near agriculture. But even at the bee lab where we're a mile from the fields, we had bee kills and we tested them and, and, and we found out that the neonicotinoid pesticide, pesticides how can I say neonicotinoid, but not say pesticides, right? <laughs> but, 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 so they put these neonicotinoid pesticides on the corn seed as a, a part of the seed treatment along with fungicides. And there's two compounds, clothinidin and thymethoxam, but thymethoxam breaks down immediately into clothinidin, so it's really the same thing. Um, so, We've done some more research on this, and we published on that last year, and it's um, anybody can read that because it's um, one of these open access online journals called PLOS One. And um, we found, we were quantifying the various routes that the pesticide can get to the bees. And the most serious route is when they plant the corn because they put um, talc in the hopper because you, you don't want a, any misses in the road. You have to have your seeds flowing nicely. And some of the seed treatment rubs off on the talc and gets out into the atmosphere because these are all air pressure driven machines. And this is what the growers have. And, and you really cannot buy untreated seed. So the growers don't really have a choice in the matter. I guess you could if you got some small seed company and you were an organic farmer and you didn't worry about not having the best genetics, you could get untreated seed. Um, but in, in any case, the talc becomes highly contaminated up to 1 to 4% uh, of clothinidin in the talc. But this is the most toxic pesticide <coughs> known to bees. And it's also water soluble, and that's why it can be systemic in the plant and protect the young plant when it's young. And, um, and even when the corn is tasseling, um, the pollen has a little bit of the clothinidin in it. It's about four parts per billion, um, which is not too much. but we found that the bees were collecting, 50% of the pollen they were collecting was corn pollen by volume because corn pollen's like this, and but the, the plantain pollen that they like is like that. Um, so the corn pollen is big. Um, so it seems like the only time you're gonna see a bee kill is when they're planting the corn. And then, you know, if it rains, a couple of days later, the problem goes away and we don't notice any problem anymore. Um, uh, we don't know about sublethal effects and we're trying to look into that too. But what happens is this talc gets on the dandelions and our bees were collecting dandelion pollen and we tested the pollen and it had about 20 parts per billion 
or more, up to actually up to 88 parts per billion of this clothinidin. And the dead bees tend to have about 4 to 10 parts per billion clothinidin in them. So just to make you aware of this, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but if you're surrounded by agriculture, this is another uh, potential stress on your bees. And maybe, oh, and by the way, I'm interruptible, so let's, we can make this a discussion. And if you have any questions, holler out. Um, so, I mean, things you can do is maybe keep your bees inside when they're planting the corn, because usually that's only about five days. I mean, you can't, hard to keep your bees inside for five days, but um, usually there's about two days that, where it's really the problem. Um, or you, if you only have one or two hives, you could put a sprinkler on it and the bees will think it's raining and they'll stay inside. And then you don't have to worry about them overheating either. Because if you screen it off, you, you have to worry that if you have a big strong hive and you screen it off and they don't have a ven enough ventilation, you could kill them. So that, be aware of that too. Um, so, yeah, we did some more um, experiments this fall. Um, I don't have the results of that yet, so, Jim. I've, I've been wondering about the, every time we turn around, there's some kind of a new pesticide. They're bringing out something new and different and better. Um, and the reason, I assume the reason they do that is because the bugs that they're trying to kill get used to that Get poison. resistant, they yeah. Get resistant to that poison. Can I expect my bees to become poison resistant, just like the rootworms and things well, like that? Uh, bees, I think bees in general are are more susceptible to pesticides than other insects. Um, when they sequenced the honeybee genome and they looked at all the detoxifying enzymes, because they've been studying insects being resistant to pesticides for a long time, and they found that bees don't have as many detoxifying enzymes as most other insects. And that was kind of a surprise, but then we, then as, you know, the scientists made up a story and said, well, it must be because the bees aren't chewing on the leaves of the plant where all of the, the plants put their, their defensive molecules. Plants have pesticides too, like pyrethrin is from plants. Um, and so since bees only feed on nectar and pollen, the plants don't put any bad stuff into the nectar and the pollen because they have a deal with the bees. And so bees aren't exposed to as much um, toxic things, I guess. That's, that's the story we made up. So bees are maybe more um, susceptible to pesticides in general. Um, so I don't think it's likely to happen. Um, soybeans? Yeah, they are treated also. I would say uh, like 99.9% .9 of the corn and I don't know what the percentage with soybeans is. It's probably about 70 to 80 percent is treated. But um, there's more of a problem. You know, I've been talking to the Bayer guys too, and the chemical companies, and they know all about this. They weren't saying anything, but they know all about it. And they told me there's more of a problem with the treatment coming off of corn than off of soybeans. It's more of a problem. So if they plant soybeans around you that year instead of corn, that's a good thing. So when they're done planting, a third of the talc is still in the hopper, and they blow it out into the atmosphere, and it drifts quite a ways. And, and we've been, Christian has an experiment last year where he's measuring how far it goes, and, and uh, He's putting little slides with sticky stuff 
at different distances and then they analyze that. But yeah, the growers need, and if you, if you have, if any of you are growers, then now you're aware and tell your friends and if you're, and if you're a beekeeper, talk to your neighbors, you know, and let them know that you would rather they didn't blow the talc out into the atmosphere. Still, some was going to come off during the planting and go into the air because um, they didn't really design the planters correctly. They just assumed everything would stay on the seed. And so it's all air powered. And there are other kinds of planters that we used to have, but we just drop them. Um, so it's, you know, they're not going to go retrofit all the John Deere planters very quickly. But they are, the chemical companies are looking into coming up with uh, an alternative to talc. They say they've got some waxy thing that's much better. Um, you know, so maybe two years from now, they'll start that. What nitrogen samples that you took uh, from the kills? Uh, you said it was about four parts per billion that you found on the types that died. In in the dead bees themselves. In, in the bees, and was that from ingesting the pollen? What was what was that from? From the talc itself? Well, I I think it was from ingesting pollen. Um, the first year that was definitely the case when we noticed this because we 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 tested well first of all Crispin my my beekeeper technician he he noticed that right off because he said Greg well you got a big problem and and we're getting some kind of pesticide kill and he told me it's not the foragers that are dying it's the young bees that are still fuzzy and don't have worn wings. And so, you know, first thing a young bee does in her life is eat pollen because she's going to be a nurse bee and get, get that protein. And so, um, yeah, and, and so the pollen that gets stored can become contaminated too. But normally beehives, during the growing season, they don't hang on to pollen very long. They, it cycles rapidly. You know, during the during the winter, they they cover it with honey and it store it away. But during the growing season, it cycles. So this fall, we did an experiment where we fed bees um, <clears throat> contaminated uh, pollen patties, protein patties. <coughs> in these high high tunnels. So we tried to get nukes and we had three treatments, untreated, low level, sublethal, higher level. And um, I, we, we still don't have the results of that. But, but in that case, we know exactly how much they ate. And so, and the low level was similar to what we found them collecting in the field. The neonicotinoids are have very low toxicity to vertebrates like us. And that's one of the reasons it became so popular. But the bad thing about them is that they are very stable compounds in the soil and in water and highly toxic to all or nearly all invertebrates, you know, even the ones in the water. And so, you know, I'm thinking if bees are taking a hit, if honeybees are taking a hit, what about the 4,000 species of solitary native bees that we have that, you know, most of which nest in the soil? Um, and they don't have a colony to back them up. It's just one female, she goes and collects the nectar and the pollen, brings it back, lays the egg, and, and repeats. So if she dies, then all her, all her young are dead. And, but the problem, what's that? Bumblebees, the like the the sweat bees, those little those little things that don't even don't even look like bees. Yeah. Those are those are bees, and <laughs> like any respectable bee, they collect nectar and pollen. So, 
and they pollinate plants. But but nobody ever really did a census. To, we don't even know what we had before in terms of species and and populations, and we don't know what we have now. So. Um, do I see any increased bee kill when they cultivate? Yeah. Because I mean, cultivating plants goes almost hand in hand. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't. I, I did have, I had two bee kills at my house last year. One was when they planted corn. They, test, <coughs> they tested it. It, came, it had clothionidin in it, in the dead bees. But then in the fall, I had another bee kill when they were harvesting the beans and spreading lime. They tested them, no pesticides. I think the lime killed them. But the soil, the level is low enough that I don't think you're going to see any bee kill. That's a sublethal dose. And, but the half-life in soil, you know, we tested some soil that hadn't had corn any treated seed in it the last two previous years. And it was just as high as any of the other samples we tested. So. I don't know. I think, I guess it was the dust from the lime killed my bees. You know, I don't, I don't know if it was the pH or just dried them out, desiccated them or, but I had all these I had hundreds of pollen foragers. They were, they were foraging on the asters, and all these pollen foragers dead in front of the hive, and all around. In, in my lab, my excuse for having a hundred beehives is to select for <laughs> resistance to varroa mites, and we have decided to, to um, focus in on the trait grooming behavior because there have been two traits that have been shown you know, to seem to be the most important for resistance to varroa mites, and they're both behavioral. One is grooming behavior, bees getting the mites off of themselves, and the other is this varroa-sensitive hygiene, and you can buy bees that have that trait. And if the varroa-sensitive hygiene is when the bees can detect the mites underneath the sealed, in the sealed brood cells. So then they'll uncap those cells and maybe remove the, the brood. And sometimes they, bees uncap and then other bees recap and they're uncapping and recapping. <laughs> and somehow this, this, this inhibits the mites mating and reproduction. And we, we put these in the lab and we leave them for, what was it, three days. And then we see how many, so each, each one is numbered by the colony, and then we see how many mites drop off. And then she gassed the bees with carbon dioxide to, to put them to sleep. And then she put powdered sugar on the bees and shook all the mites off that were still on the bees. So then she knew how many were removed or fell and how many were still on the bees. And we found that the proportion that the bees that came off of the bees correlated with the proportion of chewed mites falling off of these bees onto the sticky boards in the colony. So then we said, well, then we knew two things. Well, we also found, let me back up, we also found those that removed the most mites also had the least mites on the adult bees. So we think it's working to control mites. And, and we only got started in this because another study told us it was important. So anyhow, we, we decided this, this shows that the lab assay works but it also shows that the proportion of chewed mites is a reliable measure of grooming behavior, and it's easier than the lab assay. It's still pretty hard because you have to get the mites off of the sticky board and put them on something and look at them. 
and, and you can only look at the mites that are upside down because they usually only chew their, their legs. So I was in West Virginia two weeks ago and the guy said, well, you should call them ankle biters. So now, now we're going to call them ankle biters. And, and I was at, at the national meetings um, in January and a beekeeper told me about this website of this Austrian bee breeder. And, and this guy's got up to 94% of the mites falling are chewed. That's that's what he says. Um, we we the best we see is like sixty percent. That's like the maximum we see, and usually it's it's low. And um, so Dave Shenafield asked us to try these Amitraz strips. By the way, this is a new pesticide, a new uh, miticide that you can use legally in Indiana, which I think is much better than the other strips, the Czech mite and the Apistan, um, because it's more mite specific and um, commercial beekeepers have been using it illegally for years. Now you can use it legally and at more reasonable doses. Uh, he wanted us to use these Amitraz strips, 10 strips, so I told Crispin, well, first, let's get some mites from us sampled from those colonies to see if they're chewing the mites, because I didn't want to lose the data on 10 colonies. So that's what this is. So he did a five-day mite drop, and he, he saw from zero to 14 mites dropping from these clusters in five days. And these are these are probably mostly our worst colonies because that's the ones he wants to put strips in. And you know, one of them had five of the six mites that dropped were chewed. So that's good, but you know, a lot of them had like two mites dropped and one was chewed, so that's fifty percent, right? So you know, this, this data, I don't know how repeatable it is either. Um, I think we need to do it multiple times. Um, but then when he put a 24-hour a drop with Amitraz, he was seeing up to 142 mites dropping in 24 hours. And that's from a colony that only had one mite drop in five days. So these strips work, and you're you're actually supposed to keep them in your hive for five weeks. Um, so you're going to get a continual control. So I just wanted to let you know those are available. Um, okay. Yeah. What is the application method you refer to strips? <laughs> yeah, you would use them like you use apistan strips. You, in a strong hive, you would hang two strips between the frames and um, in the brood nest and just leave them there when you don't have honey supers on. And they, in an article I read, they didn't find much problem with residues and the wax and the honey. Of course, with anything you put in your hive, there's going to be a trace. But, uh... Now, does it get onto the bees through contact? Yes. It gets on the bees through contact and kills the mites on them. I believe they used to use this um, in, for uh, cattle ticks. So, you know, a mite is kind of like a tick. It's got eight legs. They're in the same group. And uh, so it's more specific towards mites. Yeah, Jim. On the same line as what you're talking about, um, <clears throat> Are you using ankle biter queens and ankle biter drones? Do you, do you select drones and queens to disseminate to, to help encourage more ankle biting? Yes. And, and most of what we do is open mated, <coughs> but we do also do instrumental inseminations to try to speed up the process. 
and we have a mating yard and actually our bee lab is close within flying distance of the mating yard so we pretty much flooded the area with our drones and the and the colonies that chew a lot of mites we put drone foundation in them so that we have lots of drones but we don't we don't want drones you know we raise queens from one colony and we get drones from other colonies because we don't want any too much inbreeding so yeah so that that's what we do and and so you know last year I had an undergrad um, we sampled our colonies twice last year and I had an undergrad put all these mites on slides each one's numbered by the colony and um, I don't know which ones most of them don't chew much but um, later when we have time and take a break um, you, we can put up some chairs here and you can all take a look at those and try and see what chewed mites look like um, I told her you I told her you know once you have a hundred mites off of the sticky board you can stop because that's enough and I was wondering what, what's taking her so long and she's she was like, like, took 600 mites off of one sticky board because she, she wanted to get all the, every mite off of every sticky board and put them upside down on these slides. So those are there and you can look at those later. Do you think that this is something that I could do myself in my own apiary to see if I've got ankle biters or not? Definitely. That, that's, that's the take home message. Right. And you're probably not going to find too much. Um, and if I had a chalkboard, I'd draw a mite, but they have, they have eight legs, and they have, they have these, the front legs are called pedipalps, and they're little, so we usually don't even count those. We don't look at those, and you got to get used to looking at mites, because the legs kind of curl underneath their shell, and so it, you have to make sure that the, the leg is really gone, or part of it is gone. I, I went to one of your seminars at HAS, and I found it was easier to try, of course, now they had some slides set up, so it made it easy. But if you looked at the opposing legs, uh -huh. and you could find if one was missing easier than... If one side looks different from the other, yeah. yeah. So, and these are these are dried up somewhat, so I don't know how they're going to look. I'll to have to take a look at them, but but they're pretty hard little critters. I think you'll still be able to see if they're chewed or not. Doctor Hunt, I I would like to add that I picked up one of uh, one of your ankle bibers from Chris from two eleven, yeah, from twenty eleven. Uh, used it quite extensively throughout my colonies and then uh, sold a few too. Uh, but the point that I would like to make is my, make is my my counts in the past have been relatively high. I mean, by high, I mean, you know, I, I think I had a seven one year and uh, then I had a three point, three point something last year. Well, this year's report back from Maryland is a 2.3 and that was the first year of, of any real true analysis. That I used the, the ankle biters, and that was seven out of those eight hives that were tested were, were from the Purdue genetics. So that's 2.3 percent yeah, infestation. Yeah. 2.3 mites per hundred is what it tabulates here. And uh, as of as of a couple of days ago, actually all eight of the hives were alive. I, I would have had all eight of them would have had Purdue genetics in it, except I squished one last year. Yeah. Well, that's a nice little queen. What's it hanging out her side there? Well, you know. Yeah, I mean, our our bees still grow mites, and we had oh, yeah. we had quite a few mites last fall, and I thought that we were going to have more problem than we did. And we did lose some hives, um, but we still have 82 hives left coming out of, out of about a hundred. So I I think we're okay. If they. they our winter clusters are on the small side, and probably because there was some virus from all the mites that they had. But they're going to come back. 
I find if, if you really want to grow a lot of mites, get Italians. Because Italians make a lot of brood. And anything that makes a lot of brood grows a lot of mites, because the mites are in the brood. But, but they're, I like Italians for raising, for setting up cell starter colonies, because they make so much brood. Well, I'd rather not grow a lot of mites. <laughs> So, it, well, we what well, we don't general we don't we try not to treat our bees, no, I, but I, we I'm not treating with anything except powdered sugar. Well, we do treat, but we 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 measure the mite drop on all of our colonies, and we and if it's getting really out of hand, we we treat them with Apigard after the supers are off. So I think we treated like eight colonies last year. So and it was kind of late. The, you're only treating the hives that actually need it. You don't yeah. just go through and, and treat every hive all the same. No. Right? Okay. So we had 100 hives. We treated about eight of them, I think. We, we had 130, but we got rid of 30. And so now... When you find that you, you do have to treat a colony, I know in, in my apiary, if I find that I have to do something about my mites, the other thing that I do is I'll requeen that colony from another colony, from a new, from another colony that I like the queen and I like the genetics for. Um, if I, I guess the thing that I'm saying is that it's, if there's something wrong and you need to treat it, do you do anything else besides just treating? Yes, we we requeen them. Whenever we treat a colony, we requeen it. A lot of times, though, it's just historical. Maybe that colony just grew so well that they grew a lot of mites. Um, if they had a lot of mites, but you know, we found that most of them were chewed, we might not treat it. I mean, we might not requeen. But if you don't want to treat your bees, I, I would say, you know, varroa mites is the worst problem in beekeeping. And if you're not going to control your mites with, you know, Apigard is, is synthetic thymol, but if you don't even want to use soft chemicals, then maybe you should use, dust them with powdered sugar every other week on the top. And, and if you split your colonies and make new colonies, you interrupt the brood cycle and that's going to really drop your mite levels down. Like if you have a lot of, if you lost half your colonies this winter, but you're going to split them all and, and double or triple them again, you may not need to treat this year because you know, that will reduce your mite population. No diesel comes here also. You had eight oh, he is? No, he was. Oh, he oh. In to oh okay. You had eight hives that you needed to treat out of 100 hives, so 92% of your hives did not need to be treated. What do you attribute that resistance to? Well, I'd like to think it's, you know, the grooming behavior. I, I think we also have a little bit of the, the VSH trait in our bees, um, because early on we did get some VSH stock, and I have seen that trait in our bees, although we don't go out and measure for it because we can only do so much. If, if you want to, you could, you could look for the VSH trade in your bees. The way you do it is you take a, a, a frame that has sealed brood cells with pupae that are, say, in the dark-eyed stage, worker pupae, and you uncap uncap until you find enough mites, you know, at least 50 cells that are infested. And you have to take out the pupa, and if you don't see any mature mites, or you see one mature mite, but none others, maybe some immatures, then that mite wasn't able to reproduce. So you're, you're selecting for, you're, the trait you're looking for is low mite reproduction. And, and that seems to be caused by this VSH behavior where they're uncapping the, the brood cells. What is VSH? 
varroa sensitive hygiene. Is that, is that attributed to a particular strain? It, um, not any particular strain, but you can select for these, you can select for these traits in various bee populations because honeybees are, are genetically diverse. So you can look for traits and, and take that individual and, and select for it. Like if you, want, if you like blonde bees, you can breed from blonde bees. You can lighten the, your color over generations. Just, just to be clear, when you say that you don't have to sell for a few <coughs> mites, are you saying that the fact that you know, the mite may be in that cell, feeding on that larva, does not get what it needs to be able to reproduce? Yeah, I'm saying that when the, when the pupa is in the dark eyed stage, or, or e even later, if the skin's starting to color, um, by that time, the female varroa mite that went into that cell should have mature daughters. If she doesn't, if you just see little white daughters or nothing else, that means she was not able to reproduce. And so if, if you find bees, this is, this is pretty <coughs> tedious stuff, but you know, John Harbo, who came up with this, said, "Oh, it's not. Oh, it's not that tedious. You know, in an hour I can do X number of brood frames, but um, I don't think I can do it as fast as he can. But, but you know, it, it is something that you can look at. So, are there any other questions?" Twenty percent? It's not bad. What's the question? The question is, what, what is a acceptable failure rate? Failure rate? Hundred hives or ten hives? Well, be, before the mites came, I, the typical failure rate was about on the order of ten percent. Now nationwide, we're losing thirty percent of our beehives every winter. Um, when I saw how bad the mites were in our hives and how late we treated, I'm happy with 20%. And now I can split my hives and, and I'll knock down my mite levels. If, if you don't, if you um, want to use soft chemicals, I recommend Apigard um, or oxalic acid. Now oxalic acid isn't really registered <clears throat> but um, it works great. But the problem with the oxalic acid is um, you can't use it until the bees are broodless. Oxalic acid is a very simple, nat uh, it's a naturally occurring acid in plants. So that's why you don't want to eat rhubarb leaves. Um, but the way you do it is you go to the hardware store in November and you get wood bleach, which is oxalic acid dihydrate. And you make a three and a half percent solution of oxalic acid in one to one sugar syrup. And you, so if you make up 100 milliliters, that's enough for two strong hives. You take the 50 milliliters, pop off your inner cover, Dribble that 50 milliliters right on the bees between the frames, and you'll kill 95% of the mites. And you'll start out in the spring with hardly any mites. Um, yeah. Well, that you only give them. 50, mil, 50 milliliters is like a fifth of a cup. And that's distributed over all those bees. And then they clean each other off because it's got sugar in it. So I, I don't know if they can taste the oxalate or not. But 
Uh, they do somehow they clean each other off. And it, if, if anybody's interested, I have a review article on this from Europe because they've been doing this for a long time and they've researched it. And the bees survive very well. You, you, yeah, you do it when there's no brood present so the mites aren't hiding in the brood. Because whenever you have sealed brood, about 80% of your mites are in the sealed brood. So, and also, Marion Ellis from Nebraska told me it works better when the bees are clustered a little bit. So when they're all running around, it doesn't work as well. So I, like if, if there's no brood but it's warm, it's not going to work as well. Formic acid pads? No, I haven't done any studies on that. But they work fine. I, I, uh, I just never tried them. And now <clears throat> they have these mite away quick strips. And, but I hear that some of the beekeepers don't like them. I'm not sure why. Um, had problems with what? Absconding. You yourself? So you've tried those quick strips? What, what haven't you, what, what else have you tried? She's an experimenter. What haven't you tried? Yeah, she's an experimenter, I know her. Do you use HopGuard at all? HopGuard? HopGuard I have not used. Um, at one time the beekeeper Usually the guy who bothers me is Dave Senefield. He said, Greg, we've got to have HopGuard available. And so since it's always fallen to me to petition the EPA with the help of the Office of the State Chemist to get a special registration because it's not doesn't have the Section 3 of regular registration. And the Office of the State Chemist said, well, we can't really we can't really do that because you have to be able to tell the EPA that there are no other controls available no other effective controls and so I said okay that's good I don't want to do it anyways <laughs> but but then this year Dave Shenafield came to me and said Greg we have to have the Amitraz and he convinced me because Commercial beekeepers, they, they can't, they don't have time to do, Apigard needs to be put in twice, and the other strips aren't working, and so they needed something, you know, and they're taking 1,500 hives to California. That's a big stress on their bees. And I heard, hor my, my research technician, Crispin, spent his vacation in California helping the, helping some beekeepers. And I heard horror stories out there. They're having heavy losses. It's not exactly the mites that are killing your bees. It's it's um, the interaction between the mites and the viruses. So our, our bees have viruses all the time. Just like I always have viruses in me, I'm sure. But they don't hurt me. And, and we can do we can use molecular tests to test for specific viruses in our bees at Purdue. And if I test my bees in the summertime, every colony is going to have deformed wing virus. But, and deformed wing virus is one of the worst viruses, and it's associated with varroa. Varroa mite levels get high, that then I start seeing bees that actually have deformed wings. Have you ever seen that? And, and when you see that, you know it's bad. And then you can start getting parasitic, parasitic mites in it. So usually, you know, you might have a colony, your best colony that produces lots of honey. It's booming population might be the one that has the most mites and then in the fall all of a sudden it starts dwindling down. 
and and we you know and we see that at Purdue we see dwindling and crawlers in front of the colony and um, sometimes it kills them and sometimes they snap out of it. Uh, anything else? Question. Are you using the drone frames to pull You can do that, but we don't do that. We we like drones. So what if you don't need a bunch of them? Yeah, you can get rid of some You can buy we used to buy wax drone foundation. I don't know if you can still get that, but now we buy these green plastic ones. And you can use those as mite killers. And they'll probably kill more mites than dusting it with powdered sugar. Um, you use those and powdered sugar, you can get Yep. Yeah. So once, once that drone brood's sealed, just stick it in your freezer, give it back to the bees, tell them to clean it up, and then eventually the queen will lay more drone eggs in there, and you can repeat. But you get a, get rid of a lot of mites, because most of the mites go to that drone comb, rather than the work themselves. On the drone frames, no. I've always heard them say they put them on the outside of the box, No, we put them right in the brood nest. Okay, in the middle. I think people put them on the outside because they notice that's what the bees do. The bees like to put the drones towards the periphery of the brood nest. But we, but we want them to draw that stuff out and they're going to draw it out faster in the middle of the brood nest and then we never get around to moving it and they put drones in them. They'll still put drones in them. We can, uh, when we break, whoever wants can take a look at these mites and try and see if we can find chewed mites. That's the, that's the main thing I wanted to, to, to do is that we went through this and don't forget, you're going to be right there. Greg, I, I've, I can't remember about can, using a microscope. You can coach us through that too if you want. While we're looking through the microscopes and bidding on stuff, we need to pass the hat around and uh, make sure that Dr. Uh, Dr. Hunt here gets no, some no, gas no. money. Yeah. What I tell, is, I tell my students to what count them separately. Cents? Like what this one, this right. one has the front two broken off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got money, huh? And if they put 20 hours, That one has the front two broken off. Yeah. 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 Maybe you'll win it. Oh, oh. I sure hope you do. Well, that, one's, that one's a little immature. It's pale. The different colors of the ages? Yeah, well, they should be... They should be dark uh, once they're mature. The, the legs? The little mite. Uh, it looks like you got some darker ones, and they look really translucent. Are the legs real? I mean, are they, are they that clear that I'm seeing through them? Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, I got you, and they kind of curl up and back towards you and then dip back down. Yeah. Okay, I got you. I got you. I should have found one ahead of time.